Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this presentation. Um, I've been set the task of speaking to you about protein urea in dogs. So we are often in the scenario in clinical practice where we get a positive urine result on routine dipstick. This then will raise the questions of, is it significant? Where has it come from? Do I need to treat it? And how do I treat it? Over the next 45 minutes, we are going to tackle these questions so that you feel confident identifying and managing dogs with protein urea. And we are going to do this in three steps. Firstly, we will look at the clinical implications of protein urea and why it is relevant to us in practice. We will then go on to review the anatomy, the physiology of the glomerulus, and then discuss the pathophysiology of protein urea. Once we have this understanding, we can go on to construct a methodical diagnostic approach to protein urea and talk about the appropriate management strategies. So starting off with step one, the clinical implications. So there are numerous studies that have evaluated the effects and association of protein urea with chronic kidney disease. And we now recognize that protein urea is a risk factor for the development and progression of this disease. For example, in one study of dogs with chronic kidney disease by Jacob and colleagues, a urine protein creatinine ratio or UPC greater than one was associated with a threefold greater risk of developing uremic crisis and death. Another study by Wenner and colleagues reported dogs with a UPC less than one to live 2.7 times longer than dogs with a UPC greater than one. Chronic protein urea has also been shown to be associated with interstitial fibrosis and tubular degeneration. Possible causes include the direct toxic effects of protein to the tubular epithelial cells, triggering inflammation and apoptosis, tubular obstruction of proteinaceous casts, and or decreased perfusion of the tubular interstitium, resulting in cellular hypoxia. Knowing that protein urea, even at low levels, is associated with negative outcomes, it is essential that we have this understanding of the appropriate diagnostic approach and management of these dogs. So moving on to step two, the anatomy, physiology and pathophysiology. So the glomerulus is a unique vascular structure consisting of a capillary bed between two arterioles. In healthy animals, the glomerulus filters 20% of cardiac output and it is involved in the regulation of blood pressure. Looking at the image on this slide, you can see water and small molecules cross the fenestrated vascular endothelial barrier by force of transcapillary pressure. They then penetrate the glomerular basement membrane and go on to cross the podocyte slit diaphragm and enter into the glomerular filtrate. Slice and charge selectivity of the glomerulus contributes to restricting the passage of macromolecules such as proteins. The fenestrated capillary endothelium is 100 to 500 times more permeable to water than systemic capillaries. Here, the negatively charged surface contributes to the selectivity of which molecules are filtered. So, for example, albumin is negatively charged and therefore largely excluded from the filtrate. At the next layer, we have the glomerular basement membrane, where type 4 collagen forms a mesh that contributes to the size selectivity of the glomerular capillary wall with only a small amount of substances larger than 60 to 70,000 Daltons managing to pass into the filtrate. Normally, the small amount of protein that is able to pass through into filtrate is then reabsorbed by the proximal tubule. And then finally, with the podocytes, these synthesize the glomerular basement membrane and also have a negative charge contributing to charge selectivity, and the podocytes are also phagocytic and may engulf macromolecules trapped in the filtration barrier. A healthy animal should excrete virtually no protein in the urine. 
To understand the pathophysiology of protein urea, it is helpful to think about the origin of protein loss. So these include pre-renal, physiological or functional renal losses, and then we've got pathological renal losses, and these can include interstitial damage, a defect in tubular reabsorption, or glomerular filtration. And then finally, we've got post-renal proteinuria. So we're going to look at each of these now in a bit more detail. So firstly, we'll look at pre-renal proteinuria. This occurs when there is increased filtered load of the low molecular weight proteins. Essentially, the resorptive capacity of the proximal tubules becomes exhausted, and this results in the loss of these proteins then into the urine. These proteins may be normal proteins that are not usually found free in the plasma, so we're thinking of haemoglobin or myoglobin. Alternatively, they could be abnormal proteins, such as immunoglobulin-like chains or Bentz-Jones proteins, that can be seen in dogs with multiple myeloma. Next, we have functional renal proteinuria, also known as physiological renal proteinuria. And this occurs due to altered renal physiology during or in response to certain transient events, such as strenuous exercise, fever, or stress. The hallmark of this type of proteinuria is that it is mild, and it's not associated with the presence of pathological renal lesions. It also tends to be transient, so it will resolve when the condition generating the proteinuria resolves. If we go on to looking at the pathological renal causes, so in this scenario, unlike in functional renal proteinuria, there is urine loss that is attributable to a structural or functional lesion within the kidneys. And this is regardless of the magnitude or duration of the proteinuria. The lesions can be interstitial, tubular, or glomerular, or they may be a combination of, of one of those three. And we'll look at these three in a bit more detail now. So starting off with interstitial renal proteinuria. This occurs as a result of inflammatory lesions or an inflammatory disease process where proteins are um, exudated into the urinary space. So an example would include acute interstitial nephritis. Tubular proteinuria occurs due to lesions that impair the normal tubular recovery of filtered plasma proteins. So they consist mainly of low molecular weight proteins, but can also include small amounts of moderate molecular weight proteins such as albumin. And an example of tubular renal proteinuria is Fanconi syndrome. This syndrome is most commonly reported in Basenjis and potentially inherited in sort of 10 to 30 percent of all Basenjis, and it consists of glucose urea, amino acid urea, and phosphaturea. This type of protein urea can be persistent, but the UPC is typically less than two. And then glomerular lesions that alter the perm selectivity of the glomerulus results in pathological glomerular protein urea. This glomerular injury may either be immune mediated or non immune in origin. An immune-mediated glomerular nephritis is either associated with immune complex deposition in the glomeruli that they formed elsewhere, or we have the scenario of formation of those immune complexes in situ. On the other hand, the non-immune-mediated glomerular disease may be inflammatory or non-inflammatory in origin, and examples include glomerular amyloidosis and glomerular sclerosis. The proteinuria associated with a lesion in the glomerulus tends to be persistent and the UPC is frequently greater than two. And then finally, looking at the origins of proteinuria, we have the post-renal form. And this is where we have urine protein accumulation from any part of the urinary tract distal to the kidney. So it could be from the lower urinary tract or it could be from the reproductive tract. 
the proteins are derived from hemorrhagic or exudative processes such as infection, urinary tract infection, inflammation such as vaginitis or prostatitis. And this form of proteinuria resolves on resolution of the underlying condition. For example, if you treat a urinary tract infection and that's cleared, the proteinuria should then also be cleared. The severity of proteinuria is highly variable and can be anything from mild to markedly increased. So just to summarize the anatomy and pathophysiology, we know that the glomerulus is the primary barrier to protein loss. It's important to think about the origin of proteinuria. So is it pre-renal, is it renal, or is it post-renal in origin? And then also we can have either transient or persistent proteinuria. So the persistent ones tend to be more the tubular origin or the glomerular origin, with glomerular being tending to be more than two with the UPC. So we'll now go on to step three and look at the diagnosis and management of proteinuria. So there are numerous methodologies available to the detection of proteinuria. These include urine dipsit, sulfasalicyclic acid test or SSA test for being a bit easier to say, um, microalbuminuria or urine protein creatinine ratio. And we'll go and look at each one of these in a bit more detail and when they may be useful in clinical practice. So starting off with urine dipstick, this is the most frequently used screening test for the detection of protein urea. They are easy to use, they are readily available in clinical practice, and they do have reasonable sensitivity, so a sensitivity of greater than 80% for albumin urea, and the lower limit of detection is 30 milligrams per deciliter. False negative results may occur, for example, with Bentz Jones protein urea, dilute urine, or acid urine. It's important to bear in mind that urine dipsticks have very poor specificity and therefore confirmation and quantification with other tests such as urine protein creatinine ratio are really important as well. I'll also mention that there are possible causes of these false positive results and these include alkaline urine, contact time, so leaching out of that citrate buffer and the urine remains in contact with the pad for too long, and detergents such as chlorhexidine as well. So the sulfur salicyclic test or the SSA test, this is available in some laboratories and it has a reported detection limit of five micrograms per deciliter. And therefore, unlike urine dipsticks, this test can be used to detect globulins and Bentz Jones proteins within the urine. For this test, the SSA reagent is added to a small volume of urine. Acidification results in the precipitation of the protein in the sample, which is then detected as increasing turbidity. And you can see this on the image at the bottom right hand of this corner. It is important to mention that false positive results are possible and may occur in patients that have received radiocontrast agents, cephalosporins or penicillins, and that the protein content may also be overestimated if the urine samples are turbid and have not been centrifuged appropriately prior to assessment. False negatives are also possible um, and occur with alkaline urine or dilute urine. Overall, the sensitivity and specificity for detecting microalbuminuria is only moderate when comparing to species specific ELISA testing. So the sensitivity is 73.3% and the specificity is 63.9%. Microalbuminuria is defined as a urine concentration of albumin that is greater than one milligram per deciliter, but lower than 30 milligrams per deciliter. 
So with that, it means it would not be picked up on a routine urine dipstick, where we said the lower limit was 30 milligrams per deciliter. It can be measured using either species-specific point-of-care semi-quantitative tests or ELISA techniques. The albumin measurement should be standardised to either urine creatinine concentration or USG of 1010. This test is most helpful in cases where there is a concern of false negative results on routine urine dipstick, where a low level of proteinuria may be predictive of the onset of hereditary glomerular disease, or in geriatric patients where a more sensitive screening test might be wanted, or for monitoring previously diagnosed microalbumin urea. It is important to be aware that the presence of microalbumin urea can be affected by post-renal causes such as hemorrhage or infection. And therefore, the literature recommends repeated assessment of any positive result to be performed within sort of seven to 14 days. And that's to make sure that the finding was true and that it is persistent as well. And then urine protein to creatinine ratio or UPC. This is the most commonly used method for quantifying protein urea. A UPC greater than 0.5 in the dog, and I'll just mention also in cats above 0.4, corresponds to a urine albumin concentration of greater than 30 milligrams per deciliter. And you'll remember earlier that this is the detection limit on the urine dipstick. A UPC greater than 0.2 in dogs has a specificity of 98% for the detection of microalbuminuria. However, unfortunately, the sensitivity is much lower at about 32%. I will just mention that persistent proteinuria is considered to be a proteinuria that has been identified on three or more occasions and two or more weeks apart. And this is important as it's what we need to know prior to introducing any therapy. Is it actually still there? Do we need to introduce any therapy? There has been a lot of discussion about the optimal method of obtaining a urine sample to evaluate the UPC, whether that's with a free catch, home, if it's midstream or if it's pooled samples. Recent studies have found little difference in the UPC result obtained as free catch, midstream compression, or via cystocentesis. A study by Citron and colleagues published in JVIM 2020 found no difference in the UPC in urine samples collected from healthy dogs between home and hospital. Although there are some other older studies that suggest there could be a difference. So in general, in my day-to-day -day work, I try to obtain the same sort of sample from the same environment. So either a free catch that is always obtained on arrival to the hospital or a free catch that is collected at home. And I do, when we get down to sort of managing these cases of protein urea, tend to do a free catch sample more frequently than cystocentesis, just because it seems nicer than having to stick a needle into the bladder every time you see the dog, especially if that's every couple of weeks initially. I will also mention that whilst one sample may be sufficient for the evaluation of the UPC in dogs with a UPC less than four, when it comes to dogs with marked proteinuria, so a UPC greater than four, then actually assessment of more than two samples may give a better representation of the patient's magnitude of proteinuria. So we'll just look at the interpretation of those UPC results. In healthy dogs that are non-azotemic, so a normal urea and creatinine result, the UPC should be less than 0.5. In healthy non-azotemic dogs with a UPC of 0.5 to 1, these are considered to be equivocal. So immediate treatment isn't required, but follow-up would be recommended. In non-azotemic dogs with a UPC greater than one, that is abnormal. And in azotemic dogs, a UPC greater than 0.4 should be considered as abnormal. 
And then it's useful to consider that in dogs with persistent UPC, greater than two, where post-renal causes have been excluded, a glomerular origin is considered to be most likely. So we've, we've briefly touched on how the UPC may be affected, but I'm just going to go through that in a bit more detail. So we know that hemorrhage, infection, inflammation and drugs may affect the UPC. So the UPC will increase roughly proportionally to the degree of blood in the urine due to the contribution of serum protein. Microscopic hematuria, so where we can't see it, it's otherwise yellow urine, um, but we've got maybe five to 100 red blood cells per high powered field, um, does not usually cause a difference in the UPC as identified on either dipstick or urine protein creatinine ratio. Urine samples that have more than 250 red blood cells per high power field or heavy blood contamination that we can see, obviously. Now that may increase the UPC with heavy contamination, which can sometimes cause readings to be greater than two. When it comes to urinary tract infections, the UPC can be affected significantly with reports of results reaching as high as 40 in dogs with E. coli infections. But it is important to mention that in these scenarios, the ratio does not correlate with the number of red or white blood cells seen per high powered field. So some dogs with a urinary tract infection can have normal urine protein creatinine ratios and others may have them increased. Inflammation without infection may increase it, but tends to be to less than two. And then drugs such as glucocorticoids have been associated with proteinuria. So once proteinuria has been identified, it's important to localize it. The first two steps involve one, excluding extra urinary post renal. So it may be that we consider to do an abdominal ultrasound to evaluate for evidence of a pyometra in an entire bitch. And the second one is to exclude pre-renal causes. And this is best achieved by assessing the plasma protein concentration. If the protein urea is not pre-renal and it's not extra urinary, then it must be urinary. So we then go on to rule in urinary post-renal looking for evidence of inflammation or hemorrhage in the urine sample, but without apparent clinical signs of a nephritis. So this is best achieved by evaluating urine sediment and performing a urine culture. And for these urine samples, it's really important to try and collect that urine in a sterile fashion, so cystocentesis or from an aseptically placed urinary catheter so that we're not seeing sort of contaminants that may occur in a free catch urine sample. Next is to rule in pathological interstitial renal. So in this scenario, we're looking for evidence of inflammation associated with clinical signs of active nephritis. So we're looking for an active inflammatory sediment and signs of tender kidneys, fever, renal failure, so an azotemia. If the protein urea is urinary, but it's not associated with an active urine sediment, then the remaining possibilities are functional renal or that physiological renal, which is typically low grade and transient. Or we've got pathologic glomerular renal, where the UPC can be variable, but increasingly suggestive if it's more than two and then pathologic tubular renal, which tends to be low grade with the UPC less than two, but it is also persistent. If we focus our attention mainly on glomerular disease. The general diagnostic approach for these dogs with a suspicion of glomerular disease involves three main aims. Firstly, to identify the underlying disease process. So is there an infectious disease such as leptospirosis or Borrelia um, infection? 
Is there an inflammatory or immune-mediated disease, neoplasia, endocrine disease such as hypoadrenocorticism or toxins potentially? And this can be obtained through getting a really comprehensive history to include signalment, travel history, a complete physical examination, including retinal examination, blood pressure assessment, blood and urine testing, and then thoracic and abdominal imaging. The second aim is to detect and assess the severity conditions that arise secondary to severe glomerular disease. So we're looking for the development of azotemia, hypertension, hypoalbuminemia or hypercoagulability or thromboembolic disease. And then finally, the third aim is to characterize the renal pathology in order to procure a diagnosis and help guide prognosis and therapy. And this is best achieved with a renal biopsy. So just a few moments on renal biopsy. This procedure is controversial and many vets and internal medicine specialists have varying opinions on the usefulness of this procedure and at what stage of the disease to perform it in. Whether that's immediately when you suspect glomerular disease or when there's been no response to initial treatment. So when I was reviewing the literature for a different presentation that was sort of more heavily focused on glomerular disease, I found that in the UK, glomerular sclerosis was the most common diagnosis. And therefore, many clinicians in the UK argue that renal biopsy is risky and it doesn't change the management strategy. But what's interesting was in another study in America, immune complex glomerular nephritis was the most common and therefore actually treatment may have been changed by doing that renal biopsy. So this created an interesting debate uh, at the end of the presentation and raised the question, do we truly have two different disease processes in these two populations of dogs? Or is it that glomerular sclerosis reflects an end stage glomerular disease and that clinicians in America are just picking up proteinuria and performing renal biopsies earlier in the course of disease and therefore introducing appropriate treatment sooner? It is difficult to say with certainty which scenario is true, but in the UK, the general recommended approach to dogs um, with proteinuria is that you do it when there's substantial proteinuria that's unresponsive to initial treatment or progressing despite institution of the standard therapy and or the administration of immunosuppressive therapy is being considered. So in my experience, I tend to treat with an ACE inhibitor first, and then if there's no response to the first one or two dose changes, then we go on to think about renal biopsy. I just want to mention here that there is a reasonable amount of planning required before renal biopsy can be performed in a referral setting. And, and it's uncommon for this to be performed in our first appointment. And that's just quite helpful to sort of manage carers' expectations if you are making a referral. So the renal biopsy kits need to be ordered in advance from the European Renal Pathology Service by filling in a submission form on their website, or sometimes we use America as well. And we don't tend to have many in stock because they all have expiry dates with their reagents. Next, before the procedure is performed, the hypertension needs to be adequately controlled. Coagulation and platelet numbers and function must also be adequate. So in dogs that have been started on antithrombotic medication or anticoagulant medication, the recommendation is to discontinue these antithrombotic or coagulation medications within five days of the procedure. Abdominal ultrasound is also recommended to assess the size, the shape, the contour, and internal architecture of the kidneys to assist in the identification of contraindications such as severe hydronephosis, renal cysts. It might be that it's going to be difficult to obtain it ultrasonographically um, and that actually surgical intervention is required instead. And then also we need urinalysis to include urine culture um, to make sure there isn't a UTI present at the time of sampling. So just to summarise diagnosis, um, we firstly need to identify proteinuria and that may be first done by a urine dipstick, 
and assessment of a urine protein creatinine ratio. Once we've confirmed the presence of protein in urea, we need to localize the source. Is it pre-renal, renal, post-renal post in origin? And then after having localized the source, it's important to evaluate the underlying cause, as this will help guide future management and treatment. And then in the scenario of glomerular proteinuria, it may be beneficial to obtain a renal biopsy to characterize the nature of the disease. But renal biopsies do require considerable pre-biopsy planning and are therefore unlikely to be performed during the first consultation with an internal medicine specialist. So moving on to the last part of the presentation um, and talking about the management of persistent proteinuria. And there are three key steps in the approach to managing these drugs. So firstly, we should treat any underlying disease processes that we've mentioned, so urinary tract infections, disseminated malignancies, inflammatory or systemic immune-mediated disease. And next, we need to reduce protein urea. And as mentioned earlier, glomerular and tubular protein urea tend to be the most common causes of a persistent protein urea. The most common method to reduce protein urea is typically in the form of renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system inhibition, or RAS for short. And finally, managing or preventing possible complications associated with protein urea, such as hypertension, thromboembolic disease, electrolyte disturbances or fluid balance disturbances. So antiprotein ureic agents are generally recommended when the UPC is persistently above 0.5 to 1 in the dog. Because hemodynamic forces influence the transglomerular movement of proteins, it makes sense that altering renal hemodynamics would be effective in reducing intraglomerular hypertension and protein urea. RAS is the main target, and ACE inhibitors such as benazepil are typically used as first line. They act by reducing proteinuria through decreasing the efferent arteriolar resistance, which in turn decreases the glomerular transcapillary hydraulic pressure, and then ultimately proteinuria. It also has some effect on reducing blood pressure. So if we now look at how we introduce and monitor the response to an ACE inhibitor. There are quite a few components to this, so we'll go through it step by step. And in practice, the UK, um, benazepril tends to be the most commonly used ACE inhibitor in dogs. And the recommended starting dose is half a milligram per kilogram once daily. Whilst it is uncommon for dogs to have a dose limiting worsening of azotemia because of the ACE inhibitor alone, it's still really important that we monitor serum creatinine concentration whilst these dogs are receiving the drug. Other possible complications of this drug includes hyperkalemia, which is actually a relatively common side effect in dogs with glomerular disease. And finally, the potential, although unlikely, risk of hypotension. So with this in mind, it's important to reassess the serum creatinine and the potassium concentrations and the blood pressure one to two weeks after introducing an ACE inhibitor. If these parameters remain within tolerable limits, so less than a 30% increase in creatinine, the potassium is less than six millimoles per litre and the blood pressure is above 120 millimoles mercury, the same dose can be continued for a further two to four weeks before properly assessing the UPC. If intolerable side effects are encountered with the ACE inhibitor, this should be discontinued and perhaps consider an angiotensin receptor blocker such as telmisartin. And this is typically started at a dose of a milligram per kilogram per day. And you might ask why we don't introduce that drug in the first instance um, like we do in cats but but really it's because it's quite expensive in dogs and we also have more experience with the ACE inhibitors. So two to four weeks later it's time to assess their response to therapy. A urine sample should be obtained to assess the UPC and as mentioned before try to keep the method and location of collection consistent. So for the first few checks um, and if there's any clinical signs such as polacuria that develops whilst you're monitoring dogs with proteinuria, 
I tend to submit the urine sample along with a sediment examination just to make sure we haven't got any post-renal causes that might be influencing that UPC result that I want to analyse. At this checkpoint, the ACE inhibitor dose can be kept the same if the UPC has reduced back to normal, say less than 0.5, or there's been greater than 50% reduction in that UPC. If the UPC is above 0.5, and there is a less than 50% reduction, then the dose should be increased. So typically to half a milligram per kilogram twice daily. And then these dose adjustments are provided, the serum creatinine, the potassium and the blood pressure are all within the acceptable limits that I mentioned earlier. If they aren't in acceptable limits, go back to stopping the ACE inhibitor and continuing introducing an angiotensin receptor blocker. Evaluation is then repeated four to six weeks later and similar decisions are made according to the UPC and the percentage reduction. Maximum doses of ACE inhibitor have been reported to be up to two milligrams per kilogram per day. In the event there is insufficient response to therapy, the exchange or addition of an angiotensin receptor blocker or potentially embarking on a renal biopsy at that point, if it's not already been performed, could be considered. Supportive therapy is also incredibly important in the management of dogs with glomerular disease and should be aimed at alleviating systemic hypertension, decreasing edema and ascites that may occur with nephrotic syndrome, managing hyperkalemia, and reducing the tendency for thromboembolism to occur. So as mentioned previously, hyperkalemia is commonly seen in dogs with glomerular disease and especially those treated with an ACE inhibitor. The serum potassium concentration can be reduced by feeding an appropriate home prepared diet with appropriate restriction of potassium or by lowering the ACE inhibitor dose. Adequate blood pressure control of hypertensive dogs can help reduce proteinuria and slow the progression of renal disease. Because ACE inhibitors are relatively weak antihypertensive agents, then we may need to consider the addition of a calcium channel blocker such as amlodipine as well. Platelets and thromboxane have been found to play an important role in the pathogenesis of glomerular disease. And thromboxane synthetase inhibitors such as aspirin have been demonstrated to decrease proteinuria in the experimental setting. Venous thromboembolism is also recognised complication in dogs with protein-losing nephropathy, with a prevalence of approximately 25%. Antithrombotic therapy such as aspirin or clopidogrel, therefore, has the added benefit of also reducing risk of thromboembolic disease. Diet is very important and IRIS consensus recommends feeding these dogs a renal diet where protein and sodium content are restricted. This is because a reduction in dietary protein can reduce intraglomerular pressure, the magnitude of proteinuria, and the rate of generation of uremic toxins. The use of lower protein diets have also been proven to be beneficial in slowing the progression of chronic kidney disease. Salt restriction has been reported to enhance the antihypertensive and renal hemodynamic effects of some RAS interfering drugs. Omega-3 fatty acid supplementation has shown to be renoprotective in dogs with kidney disease and to mitigate hypertension and reduce serum, triglyceride and cholesterol concentrations in humans with nephrotic syndrome. And a significant complication of glomerular disease is that nephrotic syndrome. So this is defined as proteinuria, hyperalbuminemia, hypercholesterolemia and edema. Drainage of the infusion or introduction of loop diuretics may be required if the level of edema or effusion is compromising organ function. It is however important to administer diuretics at a level that allows slow reduction of edema as rapid reduction may exacerbate hypovolemia and cause worsening azotemia, venous status and thromboembolism. The use of immunosuppressive drugs in the treatment of dogs with glomerular disease is controversial. 
Consensus recommendations suggest that immunosuppressive therapy is indicated when there is severe, persistent or progressive glomerular disease in which renal biopsy results are supportive of an active immune pathogenesis and that there's no identified contraindication to this therapy. Mycophenolate is the most commonly used immunosuppressive therapy due to its fast onset of action and is the first line treatment of choice. Prednisolone is generally avoided as it can be associated with worsening proteinuria and progressive azotemia. So we've come to our final summary, so management, and we need to focus our management of treating the underlying disease, reducing proteinuria, and then it's essential that we evaluate and manage complications of proteinuria, such as hypertension and thromboembolic disease. And mycophenolate is the first line immunosuppressive therapy for proteinuria. However, treatment is typically only recommended when we have renal biopsy results confirming the presence of an active immune process. So I'd just like to thank you all for listening to this presentation. Um, I hope that you feel more confident with dealing uh, with dogs in clinical practice with proteinuria. Um, but do feel free, if you've got any questions, to contact me at the Ralph using the email address displayed here. So here to help at the Ralph.vet. Um, or if you wanted sort of advice on a particular case, again, by all means, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much.